really nice to know that there are people listening on the live stream because we're actually reaching quite a few thousand people. So it's not only for us, although we're the privileged ones because we get to actually be in the retreat in this lovely space, but it's actually reaching out to many, many more people. You never know what the effects of that, the long-term effects will be. So it's really wonderful. And I think from all the little messages coming in from the retreat and so far, people are really benefiting from hearing the Buddha's teachings expounded in such practical ways, which are directly related to the early Buddhist texts. Hopefully some of the qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha have really been coming alive for you and helping your practice to develop in perhaps slightly new ways, you know, because not many teachers um, put so much emphasis on developing the sense restraint, you know, the way we regard and perceive and attend to the world. And uh, yeah, and all the recollections that we've been doing as well. We've been doing, you know, we started with uh, a talk on Sada in the evenings and then the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then recollecting our own goodness. Oh, we did metta. We did a bit of loving kindness at the beginning because I wanted to give you an opportunity to cultivate that as and when it feels appropriate for you in your practice. Um, it's always very handy, obviously, as a way to overcome anger and fear. And just to give yourself a little boost, you know, to add a bit of uh, juice, a bit of joy to the practice. So today, because it's the last talk, I wanted to speak about equanimity or upekha in the Pali. Um, and it's a subject I haven't really spoken about much before, and yet I have practiced it a lot, especially in my first um, type of practice, which was very close observation of the sensations in the body. And it can be a very powerful way to start to weaken the link of dependent origination between Vedana, feeling or sensation, or sometimes it's translated um, even as experience, because all experience has to basically contact our senses to be felt. Um, so that link, and then the next link in dependent origination, which is the wanting, the craving, the desire. And of course, that craving and desire includes its opposite, which is not wanting, right? Not desiring, desiring something to go away. That's also a kind of desire. And then the next link, of course, is it becomes weakened. If we can weaken the link between Vedana and craving, then the craving is actually intercepted or at least... Um, like it loses some of its power so that it doesn't go straight into grasping. It's a very subtle thing because the two are so closely related, but it actually can weaken that particular link and certainly um, cause the reaction to be much less productive of the kind of insidious kind of grasping where we're really too far in to let go. But not only that, um, equanimity is also a very important quality in dealing just with the ordinary vicissitudes of life, the ups and downs, the four worldly winds. And it's also one of the Brahma Viharas. So it can be used as a cultivation in and of itself and to be taken to very deep levels of samadhi. So I wanted to touch on all of these, but first of all, just to give a little bit of an explanation of what that word really means because I think it's often misunderstood as some kind of aloofness or coldness, even a sense of indifference. And that's not my understanding of that term at all. So upa literally means over and iksha, or it might be aksha, I'm not sure, means like eyes. I think even in Hindi today, the word for eyes is aksha. And so it means to look over, to look at things, so to speak, from above to have a kind of perspective on life. And it's a perspective that includes everything. It's not some kind of um, state that's devoid of feeling. It's more like a wise contentment that can include it all. Yeah. So one of the similes used is that it's like climbing to the top of the mountain. And from that mountain, you get a bird's eye view of the lay of the land below. Yeah, you get a proper perspective. You kind of start to understand the way things arise and pass and what causes them to arise and pass away. So it very much includes this wisdom aspect. And it's a way of regarding the world with all its suffering and pleasure, happiness, frustration, um, despair. It's a way of regarding the world with um, a sort of serenity and acceptance 
a kind of non-judgmental, non-reactive wisdom that knows how far we can help to alleviate the suffering and that also accepts when we can't do no more. So it's actually a very beautiful quality that's closely related to wisdom. And I would say also closely related to contentment. And I think the contentment aspect brings out a sort of slightly fuller, warmer meaning of equanimity, that we're so contented with things, we're equanimous with things, we can just let them be. You know, we don't have to kind of keep on trying to adjust things to our own likes and according to our preferences, but we're able to just be with things as they are and actually be happy to be with those things, happy to be there, as I said yesterday, learning to really make peace with the way things are. So it's not a kind of trying to escape from the way things are by being detached or cold or disconnected. It's actually something that's connected with the suffering of the world and yet is able to accept that this is the situation we're in. It doesn't mean that we don't do our best to try and help others. But then the point comes somewhere along the way that we have to just reflect using a reflection on karma that all beings are the heirs to their actions, so to speak. You know, all beings um, fare in accordance with their actions, depending on the quality of their volition of, of mind. Yeah. And even though we can try to do our best to alleviate that suffering, it's helpful, it's certainly helpful in my own life to reflect that their happiness and unhappiness ultimately has to depend on their own goodness, on their own virtue, on their own actions of body, speech and mind. So I can do my bit, but I can't make other people happy. I can't make other people like me or stop other people offending or abusing or reviling me. But I can learn that you know my response needs to be a wise response that doesn't create more suffering in this world. And if compassion and kindness and, um, you know, really listening to others, trying to see it from their perspective doesn't work, sometimes we have to just take a little bit more distance, take a little bit more space. And so I also think that equanimity includes the aspect of forgiveness, yeah? Because we're forgiving life, not for being perfect. We're forgiving ourselves, our bodies, our minds for not being perfect. We're forgiving the mistakes of life, the mistakes we make and the mistakes others make. And also, I would say it includes patience, genuine patience, you know, the patience to just wait with whatever's there rather than try to get away from or move beyond. Adrian Brown has this really lovely way of defining patience. He says there are two types, actually two types of waiting. He says there's waiting in the moment or on the moment and there's waiting in the future. <laughs> These are the two types of patience. And I think this is really wonderful because often when we think we're being patient, we're actually being patient in order that things change. <laughs> it's like, I'll be equanimous, I'll be content, I'll be patient with this particular situation for a certain amount of time, but then I wanna check, is it working in other words, is it producing the desired effect, right? And that's not really patience, that's looking one step ahead. So real patience, real equanimity, real contentment is being exactly where you are right now without any wish to be anywhere else in the world, you know, without any thought of the future or the past. Of course, the thoughts of the future and the past might arise, but even then we can just recognize that these things arise and pass and we don't need to be swept away by all the stories and thoughts that our mind spins up. So one of the things that Ajahn Brahmali has been talking about quite a lot in this retreat is how to overcome anger. And I wanted to talk about this from a slightly different perspective because most of the time we've been looking at how we overcome anger towards others. But there's also a few places in the suttas where the Buddha talks about how to use equanimity when people are angry with us. And I think this is, again, really important because it's not always wise to stay in the firing line. And yet sometimes we can't get away. So he gives these five ways to overcome anger in the Anger to Nikaya 5161. And the first is loving kindness, as usual, because this is the most expansive and also probably easiest to access of all the Brahma Viharas. And the second one is compassion, that we understand this person's suffering and we wish them freedom from suffering. 
regarding them like somebody maybe who's ill. You know, they can't really help what they're doing. They literally are out of their mind. And then the next one is equanimity. And I think this is really interesting because there's another passage. It's Angutva 327. <laughs> I've been doing a little bit of reading because I find it so interesting to look into the suttas with a particular theme in mind. And this one is talking about what kind of person should be regarded with equanimity, with upekka, with this sense of just looking on without getting involved. <clears throat> because we don't want to do that with people we can respond to with kindness and compassion. So here it says that um, the person to be regarded with equanimity, not to be associated with, followed or served, is one that's prone to anger, easily exasperated. Even when criticized slightly, they lose their temper. And then this simile is given that it's as though they have a festering sore and you strike that um, saw, you know, for example, if they're criticized slightly, it's like striking their saw with a stick and it discharges even more matter. It's pretty gross, isn't it? But you can see those kind of people who are so angry already, you know, one little thing that you say and they just react and everything gets even worse. And so the Buddha says we should regard them with equanimity, why? because they may insult, revile, or um, harm us, yeah? So again, the Buddha's compassion. We shouldn't just always stand in the way of abuse and accept it and think that because we're meditators, we have to, as Goenkaji used to say, my first teacher, let them just come up with a knife and cut me like a vegetable. <laughs> you know, I'm economist. I'm just like standing here and allowing others to, you know, throw their slings and arrows and uh, abuse me and, and say nothing. That's really equanimity. That's actually not equanimity. That's more like stupidity, I would say, allowing yourself to be abused. So he's actually saying in this case, like have some distance, regard them first of all with equanimity. And then the next method is to actually give them no attention. And I think this is quite interesting. It's translated as ignore that person in this particular sutta which can sound maybe a bit cold, but I think what it means is not putting them in the center of your world, in the center of your mind, in the center perhaps of your living room on TV. <laughs> Sometimes I say this to my parents because they watch stuff from the news and of course they have their particular, they, they don't like certain politicians, which I think most of us probably find a little offensive, but um, you know, they'll report back as to what they've been talking about and to how, offensive and, and distasteful it is and how it makes them angry. And I say, but, you know, by having them on the TV in your room, it's like you're inviting them in for tea. It's like they're your guests, right? You're hanging out with them. It becomes your company, right? You're basically like zooming them right into the middle of your space. And I think in this case, you know, we can really consider that as like ignoring. We don't have to turn on the TV. We can turn it off. We can zoom in Ajahn Brahmali or Ajahn Brahm or myself instead or any other Dhamma teacher that you like. You know, you don't have to associate with people who just spread their toxicity and spread so much suffering for ourselves and everyone else. And again, in the last case, the fifth one, it's to apply this idea of karma, to just recollect that these people, all beings, all beings, whether they do things we like or not, are basically acting from their own conditioning, from the way they've been raised, from the input that they themselves have had. You know, if you associate with bad friends or people say with extremist views, then sooner or later, that's going to rub off on you before you even know it. That's how advertising works, you know, it's subliminal. So what to say for things which are overt, if we can be influenced by subliminal adverts that they just pop between like little screens on your, TV, sometimes you don't even know they're doing this, and it's bending the mind. So again, it, it to me, points towards the importance of wise friends as a help and an aid to developing these qualities of loving kindness and equanimity. And then there's a very nice um, quote by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, who also defines equanimity in terms of how we respond to the four worldly winds have you heard of the four worldly winds in Buddhism? So Bhikkhu Bodhi says, equanimity 
or equipoise or even mindedness, if you like, is an evenness of mind, an unshakable freedom of mind, a sense of inner equipoise or balance that cannot be upset by the four worldly winds. It's indifference only to the demands of the ego with its craving for pleasure and position, not to the well being of one's fellow beings. He says human beings, but I think it really means all beings. So it's not indifference to other people's well being, but it is indifference to our own inner cravings and selfish desires, yeah, to the demands of the ego, to Mara, if you like you know, always telling you what to do, pushing you around, trying to control you, especially when you're just about to get into deep meditation. That's when Mara gets really scared and wants to sort of say, hey, no, 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 stay, stay, you know, with the body, stay in this sensual realm. <laughs> Don't go any further. It's scary. It's dangerous because he doesn't want to lose your control, lose control of you. Right. So these four worldly wins, gain and loss, it's pretty obvious, isn't it? That sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. Sometimes we might accumulate wealth. Other times, you know, the market changes or, you know, the house prices change and what was once a lot of money becomes really worth not very much. And actually in America, I experienced a lot of gain and loss. I mean, not myself, but just seeing the way that, that because there's no sort of social support system in that society, People who are, you know, middle class, pretty affluent, fairly well off, can go from having a normal family life and a nice home and then perhaps getting a cancer, which requires treatment that maybe costs thirty or fifty thousand dollars, and they have to sell their home, you know. And there was a woman like this that I met, and um, she was very, very frightened of being on the streets. And, uh, and yeah, many people that I met in that country had known somebody in their circle of friends who'd ended up being in the, on the streets. So things can change so, so quickly. And again, they're really out of our control. And then the next one is fame and disrepute. So one minute you're the bee's knees. This is Ajahn Brown's phrase, but it's just came to mind, it's funny. He said this actually after the bikini ordinations. He said, one minute you're the bee's knees, the next minute you're the bee's vomit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense in non-English languages, but the bee's knees means you're really cool and funky and everybody loves you, you know, you're the kind of latest hit, latest thing, and yeah, the next minute you're the bees vomit. So, <laughs> but for someone with so much equanimity as Ajahn Brahm, you know, he doesn't get shaken very much at all. I mean, I think for him, he was surprised. He didn't expect that kind of reaction, but you know, then he just shrugged his shoulders and said, okay, but well, I did what I could, you know, I did the right thing and he can live with himself. He can live very happily with himself without any regrets. So this fame is anyway, incredibly transitory and very fickle, you know, it's not something really worth um, going after at all. Even for myself, even though I think of myself as like your kind of non next door type of friendly um, monastic who just you know gives a little bit of advice and a few tips here and there even for me I'm starting to be known and <laughs> it was really bizarre I was walking down the street a few days ago and uh, somebody came up to me and said uh, Mifrand Kanda <laughs> mispronouncing my name Mifrand Kanda can I interest you in a tart and I thought huh I said, but how do you know my name? I was like genuinely surprised. Oh, you know, Facebook and this and that. I was like, oh, okay. And uh, and then they had this, yeah, they said they'd been wanting to um, offer something to me for a while, but because of the COVID, obviously it wasn't possible. And so he opened this box of um, French tarts full of custard and, you know, and sort of cream and fruits and everything and said, just take one. So it was five in the evening. So here I am with this like French tart sticking to my hand and walking down the street thinking, hmm, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> it was really cute, actually. I felt really quite like, wow, this is a nice little gift. But luckily I was on my way to meet a friend so I could relinquish it and offer it to her. And she was rather happy about it. But it's really bizarre because, you know, the way that other people see you is not the way you see yourself. The way that we see ourselves is changing anyway all the time. So how do we know how anyone else sees us? It really doesn't mean very much. We're the only ones who can really know what's going on inside. 
And a lot of the time, you know, not only in my position, but for everybody throughout their life, whatever role you play for others, a lot of the time, you know, people just have their projections. They're not, you know, seeing you as you are. They're bending things, they're projecting whatever particular, you know, thing you trigger in them, it gets projected. So very rarely do we um, really understand another person. So this fame and disrepute, it doesn't really matter if you criticize even the Venerable Ananda, the Buddha's um, attendant for 45 years, he also got criticized. There's a sutta, which I, I don't remember where it is, um, where apparently somebody was criticizing him for speaking too much. And so then he started to speak a bit less and then he was criticized for not speaking enough. And the Buddha just said, look, you know, in this world, you're, some people will criticize you for speaking too much, some people for not enough. And that's always the way it's going to be. You can see it on social media. Somebody says, wow, this is so inspiring. What a wonderful Dhamma talk. The next person says, this is terrible. These sort of monastics shouldn't even be giving Dhamma talks. <laughs> and it's all on the same theme, you know. So this uh, kind of fame and disrepute. Um, what are the other ones? Uh, I always forget these. Gain and loss, fame and disrepute blame and praise, so it's very similar, and then pleasure and pain. These are the four worldly winds. And we love to be praised, obviously. We even love to be praised about our practice. You know, we're practicing to get the big jewel in the heart of the lotus. And that can lead to a lot of overestimation in spiritual circles. So there's a story that I just can't resist telling, which many of you will have heard, because again, I'm lifting it from Ajahn Brahm's repertoire <laughs> with his free permission, of course. But this is the story of, um, yeah, it was a monk. I'm not going to change it to a nun. So it was a monk <laughs> living in an isolated little island in the middle of a lake. And he was there on solitary retreat for like two or three years, I think. And um, I'm not sure if it's a true story, but it's nice to think it is. <laughs> and his uh, master was on the mainland, you know, um, and making sure this monk was looked after so that he'd send a boat every week with the weekly food that he needed to sustain himself. And after about a year of practice, um, the monk on the island started feeling that he was really equanimous, you know, so equanimous that nothing was affecting him anymore. He was so content, life was very simple. You know, there was no more reactivity that he could see in his mind. And uh, one day he decided to ask the person in the boat to bring him some ink and a very fine quill and some paper to make some calligraphy. So he got these things and then he took a long time to write down these beautiful words to send to his master. And he wrote something like, oh, the diligent monk alone in solitude is no longer shaken by the four worldly winds, something like this. So it was a kind of declaration, right, of a very high stage of meditation, maybe even enlightenment, who knows. And uh, he sent this over to the mainland to his teacher. And his teacher looked at it and uh, he wrote a message back. So imagine how excited this monk on the small island was to get this message back, you know. So he opened it up and he looked at his, and he's like, huh, this is my calligraphy. And oh, it's got scribbled all over in red, in red ink. And what had happened is that um, at the end of each sentence, Actually, through each sentence, the master had written this big red line and crossed it out and written the word fart. And then he just crossed out the second line, fart. <laughs> Sounds a bit rude, doesn't it? And this monk was so livid. He was absolutely incensed that this teacher could be so rude and ruin his calligraphy like that. How does he, how dare he speak to me like that? He can't recognize enlightenment when it's in front of his nose. So he got on the next boat, the next time the boat person came, he got on the boat and went back, ran into the abbot's uh, room and said, slammed down the paper on the desk and said, what is this? You know, this is terrible. How dare you speak to me this way? And then the abbot very calmly and quietly took the paper. The diligent monk alone for three years or however long, can no longer be moved by the four worldly winds. And just a few little farts blew you all the way over the lake. <laughs> the four worldly winds. It must have been four times that you wrote fart, fart, fart. So, so much for the four worldly winds that um, 
that upset him pretty quickly. So, you know, it's all very well when everything's going sweetly, but how is it when we're actually criticized rather than praised? How do we respond? This is really a measure of our depth of wisdom, our depth of insight, and also of our self-view. Are we still clinging to self-view and making a kind of spiritual ego? You know, many times people talk about ordaining as becoming a bhikkhuni, and I really try to avoid that language. I mean, I know that when people say it, they don't, you know, they don't mean anything by it, but I think it's really important as monastics to remember that we're not trading in one identity for a new more polished, improved version of the same suffering self, just a more spiritual and lofty version. So you don't become a bhikkhuni, you actually renounce, you renounce aspects of what you take to be a self. Superficial aspects at first, you know, your hair, your clothes, but along with that, you're renouncing deeper things, you're renouncing all the ways that you identify yourself in this world, you know, the, the, what you've done in the past whether it's uh, being a good student or a poor student, your career, your profession, even the family to which you belong, you know, your sense of identity is getting weakened. It's no longer um, described or um, confined to what you do in the world, because now actually, what do you do? <laughs> You're just practicing to understand the nature of this body and mind. And one of the natures, of course, of the body and mind is just how conditioned it is, you know, how incredibly conditioned. And uh, there's another really nice sutta, it's the uh, Maha Havati Padopama Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya number 28. And in this sutta, the Buddha's also um, giving some really wonderful advice about how to react when we're abused, reviled, or scolded, you know, even how a monastic should react. And he says that one should understand that any painful feeling, uh, this particular painful feeling, born of ear contact has arisen. This is dependent, not independent. Dependent on what? Dependent on contact. Yeah? The sound coming in contact with the ear sense door. And that gives rise to ear consciousness. You're aware of the sound. Then one sees that the contact is impermanent. And guess what? If contact's impermanent, then feeling is impermanent also. So the feeling arises only when there's contact between the sense door and the object of that sense door and the consciousness, the ear consciousness that arises as a result. So he sees that contact is impermanent, that feeling is impermanent, that perception is impermanent whether you like that contact or not, how you perceive it as pleasant or unpleasant. That formations are impermanent. I would say here that the best translation here for that really is like volitional reaction, something like that. Like your reaction to the feeling and to the way you've perceived that feeling becomes sankara, becomes like will in a way, but it's like a reaction which is a heap of karma, actually, um, and also a heap of suffering. And that consciousness is impermanent. So we understand that all those things are impermanent. And then the interesting part of this sutta is that the next thing we can do is recollect that, uh, yeah, in this sutta, it says we can then recollect the Buddha's advice in the simile of the saw. Right? So first we understand that these things that have arisen are dependent on contact. So we don't need to worry too much about it. That contact anyway is impermanent. And then the next step in this uh, process of, you know, reacting skillfully is to actually remember the simile of the saw. So here it says, let's say mendicants. That's not a bad translation. Mendicants. If bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb with a two-handled saw, one who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. So tireless energy shall be aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness established. My body shall be tranquil and untroubled, my mind stilled and unified. And now let contact with fists, clods, sticks and knives assail this body for this teaching of the Buddhas is being practiced by me. So that's not inviting the abuse, 
but this is in the situation where we have no way out from that. So basically, as long as our mind is established, you know, tirelessly with unremitting mindfulness, remaining tranquil and untroubled, unified in samadhi, really no knives, nothing outside can harm us anymore, right? And then it's very beautiful because this ties in to the recollection of the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And it says, when that person thus recollects the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, if the equanimity supported by the wholesome does not become established, then one arouses a sense of urgency to establish it. I'm just summarizing it a little bit. Um, but if when one recollects the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha, in this way, by remembering the Buddha's teachings on the simile of the saw, equanimity supported by the wholesome becomes established and one is satisfied with it. At that point, friends, much has been done by that mendicant. So it's very interesting because this kind of links equanimity from a wisdom practice, understanding that everything that arises at the sense doors is impermanent. It's not me, not mine, not a self, right? to remembering the Buddha's teachings, remain, remembering to abide with a heart of loving kindness, to establish mindfulness, to remain tranquil and untroubled. And that in itself is considered one of a way of recollecting the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, to give us strength, to give us encouragement, you know, not to react, not to create bad karma for ourselves. And if we can do that, then it should lead to equanimity. So there's many ways to practice equanimity. And the last way that I do want to touch upon, which I thought would be more the center of this talk, but anyway, is to practice equanimity as one of the Brahma Viharas. And I think it's very lovely to notice that it is categorized as a Brahma Vihara because the Brahma Viharas are expansive states of mind. They're benevolent states of mind. And again, that suggests that equanimity is an aspect of love. It's an aspect of loving kindness. You could even say it's the way that love responds when there's nothing more you can do to help, right? If metta is the way love responds to those, to general beings in this world, let's say, it's not specific, it's very open, very impartial. Compassion is more the way that love responds when it meets suffering. Mudita is like love's response to those who are happy, successful, celebrating with them, you know, celebrating their goodness, their success with them. And then equanimity could be seen as the way love responds when there's really nothing more you can do. So it's not the first go-to Brahma Vihara. It almost, to me, seems to contain the other three. It's almost an outcome of the other three. And it's just that the situation, you know, or the person to wh towards whom you're developing that metta and compassion is in a slightly different position in their life. So an example of that from my personal experience is um, on a retreat quite a few years ago where I was practicing a lot of loving kindness. I had no intention to start developing the other Brahma Viharas. I was just content to practice loving kindness. And at that time I was practicing towards my best friend. It was actually her birthday. And I remember spending three whole days just on her to send, to really, really build it up very strongly. And around the same time as that, actually, a person who'd harmed me very much, who I hadn't included intentionally in my metta, just came into mind and almost like partook of that metta, that loving kindness. It was as though there was enough to share. And, you know, like I said before, because the mind is big, it's expansive, you know, in the sort as it says, it abundant, exalted, immeasurable. Because the mind is big, like a big lake, that little bit of salt in the lake had no impact at all. So it felt sweet, the water was still sweet, the metta was still flowing and it helped me overcome any um, remaining trauma, signs of trauma or fear or upset around this person and what had happened there. But then I just carried on practicing the metta meditation for a few more days and I chose a different um, person to send the loving kindness to who is a, an old lady in Myanmar, she's a Burmese woman and she was almost like one of my Dhamma mothers, you know. In Asia, people tend to really take you under their wing. And in Burma, there's a great respect for anyone who's practicing the Dhamma, and especially those who come and ordain in that country. And so she was always there, actually, from the beginning, even long before I ordained. 
we knew each other and um, you know she'd invite me to her home and she was one of these women who's just so incredibly strong and resilient even though she'd lost a daughter who died actually of asthma in Bodgaya many years ago and so she'd been through suffering but it's not as though I thought of her necessarily in terms of someone who was overtly suffering but when I chose her as my object I just continued sending meta and it changed its kind of quality it changed to something I could identify as compassion which was very interesting because it also showed me how spontaneous and natural these Brahma Viharas really are it's almost as though love does know exactly what form to meet the object in exactly what's appropriate in a given situation and so it turned into compassion and I guess in my heart I was more connected with the suffering in her life and perhaps even the suffering in the world as a whole because from there it seemed to turn into a very serene and very cool composed kind of equanimity it felt as if I was standing on a mountain top and sort of regarding the world with very unjudgmental soft eyes but soft eyes accepting that there is so much suffering you know and although we can try our best to help Basically, this is the nature of samsara. And there was a real sense of coolness, even delight with that. Because as a Brahma Vihara, of course, you know, they carry the qualities of joy, they carry the qualities of happiness. And equanimity is a cooler, more subtle, even more, um, how would you say, even more deeply nourishing kind of happiness than things like piti and sukha. It's even more blissful in a very cool and not detached, but kind of a big perspective kind of way. And I think that equanimity, when it develops with our meditation practice in the background, it does help to balance any kind of, um, not only reactivity to unpleasant sensations, but also any over excitement with PT or any fascination with it, you know, maybe a little bit of agitation that can come when there starts to be like subtle sensations of bliss, maybe kind of coming up your spine, or sometimes I get it where it's like melting down my head, or, you know, even more refined kinds of PT still are quite not agitating, but they're not as cool as equanimity. And over time, when we sort of get accustomed to the PT, after a while we just start to incline more towards peace and then these um, qualities can deepen into more um, of a contented joy and of course equanimity. Equanimity is actually perfected in the fourth jhana I think, so that's like the highest type of equanimity and I can't claim to have experienced anything that deep myself but I can definitely um, look back on all my time actually even with the practice of insight meditation where equanimity was very much encouraged to be developed and say that it's a pleasure that's higher than PT and pleasant sensations it's a it's a kind of happiness and coolness and sort of stability of mind that really can contain it all so it's not pushing away the unpleasant. It's not a state that's even devoid of the unpleasant, but it's more um, a state of mind that can stay serene throughout, throughout all of it. And of course, when we are practicing Vipassana and really working at that level of sensations in the body and seeing how they arise and pass, not only that they arise and pass, you know, pleasant things come into existence and pass away, unpleasant things, neutral sensations arise and pass. But we also have to dig a bit deeper and start to understand how this is happening, how this whole process is being fueled. And with that equanimity, we start to be able to really step back and watch to the point where we're not involving in the process and we're not fueling it. So the clinging, the fuel, if you like, for those sensations to continue starts to be, um, starts to dwindle. And the aspect of passing away becomes predominant. So at first, you know, when we meditate and sit down, everything's kind of quite active in the mind. Your thoughts arise, sensations arise, even joy arises. 
But after a while, when we get the taste for something more cool and when we learn to, you know, be at peace with a wider and wider range of experience, we start to, things start to naturally fade away. They start to, the quality of passing becomes predominant. And we realize that this is because we're not clinging, because we're not fueling the process. And of course, that has to be taken much deeper to you know, get into things like stream entry. But in the same sutta, the Majjhima 28 that I just read, the Buddha actually talks about um, you know, learning to see these things as not me, not mine, not a self, learning to see them as arising and passing, and to see you know, the ending of clinging, and to see how that clinging continues the process. And when we see that, we see dependent origination. And in that sort of, it is the place where he says, one that sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And all of this is due to this whole process, let's say, it's the whole gradual process, but I think a lot of it is that equanimity. So even though we can't necessarily stop the chain at that stage between Vedana and craving, we can certainly weaken it. And if you can weaken craving, tanha, then of course it's weakening delusion because delusion is nourished by craving. It's one of the five hindrances, desire, you know, craving, wanting is one of the five hindrances. So the whole thing starts to slow down and hopefully eventually start to turn around into its either opposite direction or of course into the sequence of dependent liberation. So that's a little overview of some ways of practicing equanimity, whether in your daily life with dealing with difficult people or um, of course for yourself when you're you know, prone to, to move into reaction and anger, also ways of practicing it as a Brahma Vihara. You know, you can choose your own phrases just as you do with loving kindness. One of mine is uh, based on Sharon Salzberg, actually. Something like, all beings fare in accordance with their karma. Their happiness and unhappiness depends on that and not on my wishes for them. It's a little bit long, but you can definitely get a sense for it and maybe just, you know, bring it down to just a, a simple phrase or two. May I just be at peace with the way things are. May I learn to be at peace. Or may I develop contentment? You know, all these ways are just little nudges for the mind. And I wanted to end um, with something that may be a little tangent in a way, but um, just to encourage you, really, by saying that whatever you consider the results of this retreat for you, I think it's really important to also have equanimity to how you think you've performed or not because every step you've taken on this path is a really significant step in the Dhamma. And you should be very glad, very joyful about it. And it doesn't end here, right? The Dhamma is for the whole of life. The Dhamma should be applied in everything we do. And there's a beautiful quote by Tenzin Palmo that I just wanted to read out, which really seems to bring all that together for me. And hopefully it can be useful for you when you go, you're not going home, are you? You're already at home. <laughs> I was going to say when you go home but anyway hopefully you'll be going deeper and deeper inside to your inner home so she says if we use every action of body speech and mind as our practice by cultivating awareness being present in the moment seeing things with clarity and understanding opening our heart in kindness and love thinking about other people and how they feel then there's certainty that there'll be a transformation. If we think that Dhamma practice is only what we do when we go to a Dhamma center or a Zoom retreat, or when some Lama is visiting or some Ajahn, when we go for Dhamma talks or sit, meditate together or do some puja, if we think that this is Dhamma practice and the rest of the day is just so much extra time, then there'll never, even after an eon of time, be any transformation. We have this precious life now. This is our opportunity. If we let it go, who knows if the opportunity will ever come again. Now is when we have the freedom to practice. We have the teachers. We have the intelligence to understand. 
and we have a motivation to really genuinely want to practice. This is so rare. <laughs> That's by Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo of the cave in the snow. She's the nun that lived in that cave for many, many years, which makes it even more inspiring because it shows how she brought it really into every aspect of her life. So, shall we do some meditation? So taking your time to stretch a bit if you need to, shake a bit, <laughs> wiggle a bit, adjust your clothing or adjust your limbs. Get more pillows, get more blankets if you need to. This is how you begin with loving kindness to your body. with your eyes closed, suffusing mindfulness with kindness. And just allowing that to soak through your body. As though the sunshine were reaching each and every cell. Just let it be natural, don't force anything. It may be blockages in the body, places with no obvious sensation. Doesn't matter at all. Just meeting your body, meeting your experience with mindfulness and kindness starts to reveal the nature of this body and mind. And the kindness enables the mind to stay with the experience rather than recoil away. Your body knows it's in the kindly presence of the mind. A kindness that just looks over doesn't try to change, doesn't judge. very gently invites any tensions to relax. Just by suffusing them with warmth.
Noticing the natural composure in your body, in your mind when you sit. And again, I'd like to invite you to begin by recollecting any quality within yourself that you value, that you respect. Maybe something that came up today, or just a particular trait that you know is a strength. You might even recollect a time that that has been helpful to you or someone else, has alleviated someone's suffering, has offered them a supportive ear, supportive hand. See if you can take courage from this. And allow this quality to fill your mind. Relaxing any effort, any intention. Just see how this goodness, this wholesome state of mind feeds in, lends support 
to serenity inside. You may notice feelings in the body, sensations. They may be pleasant or unpleasant. Or maybe somewhere in between. Whatever sensations arise, they arise just to pass away. Vedana feeling is not me, not mine, not a self. This reflection, we learn to regard all sensations with equanimity. You may have emotions, moods, maybe thoughts passing through your mind. Can you notice, regard them just like clouds in the sky? Arising due to causes, passing away when those causes cease. But your mind remains serene. Expansive. Cool like the sky.
And as your mind quietens, you may become aware of the breath. See if you can regard that breath as a visitor, something that doesn't belong to you. It's not yours to possess. comes in, reaches a peak and subsides. Like waves lapping the shore of a lake. If you find your mind is moving ahead of itself, just ask yourself, what do I expect? What do I want? And see if you can recenter. more and more deeply into now. Contented with this moment, not clinging to the past experiences or any hope, any expectation for the future. understanding none of this, 
belongs to me. It belongs to nature, to cause and effect. So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. See if you can notice any calm, any sense of equipoise, balance, peace. And just notice how that feels. See if you can understand how it came about to whatever degree
Okay, it is time for maybe the last question and answer session, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure there'll be one tomorrow. We might do more of a closing talk in the second session, we'll see. You never know, so you have to be equanimous to all eventualities. <laughs> Somebody's written a very nice message, I think. Okay, I'll read it because nothing else is coming in yet. I just want to thank Ajahn Brahmali and Ben Chanda for their wonderful, clear teachings, especially for bringing the suttas alive in such a profound and practical way, especially on the importance of joy. This has been very nourishing for my practice. Profound gratitude also to the support team, Derek, Leone, Mel and Rennie and Matthias for the silent practice group and all those working behind the scenes or who I've missed out. Shout out for Annie at Bookings and all my fellow retreatants, wonderful. So I'll consider that a thank you on behalf of everybody because you've covered absolutely everyone there. So, uh, <laughs> so I'll let that speak for all of you. And thank you too for being wonderful retreatants because that's how it's possible to teach, you know. It's not possible if there's no receptivity or love for the Dhamma, but because you all have great love for the Dhamma, you're like sponges. You're just like waiting for something that either of us say that will be helpful. There's no criticism there. I mean, there might be, but I don't feel it. So it's wonderful, really. Um, Okay, more notes of praise, which is wonderful. Okay, Ooh. now there's lots. Okay, from your personal experience, what advice would you give to skillfully approach a Vipassana retreat? The method. I'm not quite sure if you're asking for me my advice on a particular method or I'm not really sure maybe you can clarify because otherwise I'll be answering sort of through guesswork I only really know I suppose I practice two types of Vipassana retreat which is Goenka and a little bit of Mahasi as well actually a few retreats but relatively little so if you don't mind and you could clarify a little bit I'll come to it definitely what would you recommend when you feel frustration and disappointment of other people, yourself and in general with the world, and you can't meditate because you feel that tension? I would say that you may be misunderstanding what meditation means because you can always meditate. Meditation is not something that requires a certain experience. Meditation is the way that we relate to the tension. So, of course, it will be harder if the sensations are unpleasant, if there's tension and if, you know, there's a story behind it around disappointment and frustration with yourself and others, of course, it's not pleasant to be with it, but you can still meditate because you can still notice that you have those kind of ways of relating and that that is building suffering. And when you notice that, you may remember that the Buddha says, instead of that, try to develop um, attitudes of loving kindness, of non-cruelty, right? Non-cruelty would include not being frustrated or disappointed with yourself, but being understanding towards yourself, right? And it doesn't mean the frustration will go away, but it's being understanding and kind to the frustration itself, yeah? And when you do that, then the frustration has less power over you. It doesn't become such a problem anymore. It's like underneath the frustration and disappointment, there's probably something else. Maybe there's some sadness, maybe there's some, um, it's probably sadness, a slight bit of ill will. And sometimes when we can go underneath it or when we can meet it with compassion, we get inside it and it actually softens quite a lot. Maybe you might have some tears, or, but at least it's a beginning to soften these emotions that seem very stuck. So you can meditate, but just meditate with more gentleness, without expectation of how you should be feeling, 
um, without trying to get rid of the frustration and disappointment and disappointment. Um, just trying to make peace with it, give it some space. These things do go away in time. So I hope that helps a little bit. I mean, the other thing, I guess, if you're frustrated and disappointed with yourself, others and the world in general, <laughs> is to try to look for things in the world that are good, right? Because the world is a mixed bag. If we're reading the news, then we're going to get very disappointed and frustrated with the world because it always only gives us the bad news. And that's because that's the only thing that really sells and captures people's attention. So sometimes we're already in this kind of vortex of negativity. And because of that, we just draw more and more to us. We just kind of gravitate to things that just keep on fueling that misery. And sometimes it's enough to notice that's what you're doing and just to make a decision to stop and to see if you can put your attention on something different, something beautiful. Thinking about maybe people in hospitals, like who work in hospitals or who work in nursing homes, people who give a lot of service, a lot of charity. Um, you know, the fact that if you were in the street and something happened to you, you were hit by a car, I can guarantee there'd be many people that would come to help you and to you know, look out for you. So sometimes we just forget because we're in these kind of bubbles and we're just allowing only one kind of impression in. And the difficult thing is when our mind's already in a sort of negative state, it will see everything kind of colored gray. So I think the first point is to really start to relate to that suffering with some compassion, you know, to allow it to be there, but to be really kind with it and just allow yourself to feel sad. That's fine. That's meditation. Meditation is not about trying to get somewhere else or to get a certain experience. That's just a product of wise ways of relating to life. Okay, I'm living in a very small, I'm living very alone in a small village in the country, very calm when I came here two years ago, but now with the pandemic by the people, I almost don't see anyone. I'm making refuge in the Dhamma and it's been very important to have these retreats. When the retreat finishes, the solitude comes back. Do you have any advice? Yes, you can join my weekly sessions. I do at least one or two a week. But there will be less of those during the rains retreat because I go on retreat, but we'll still be having two a month. One will be like a group where it's sort of peer led. So maybe you'll listen to a talk and have some discussion afterwards. And one will be another bhikkhuni who's coming to teach. So that's still possible. And I do think those groups are good because they're Zoom groups rather than just YouTube talks. So there is some interaction. There's a sense of being among the company of others, and actually many of them are here right now. So you'll be meeting the same people if you come to some of those groups. And the other thing I would say is to try and keep a perspective on the fact that this is the pandemic period. It will not always be like this. And I have to tell myself that because now after one and a half years or so of being completely alone, I'm starting to see a few people, but it's still, I feel like the longer term effects of isolation are actually there. For the first eight months, I didn't feel too badly affected. I felt quite good, actually. I had a lovely retreat and I was in total solitude and I was very, very content in my own company. And before that, I was actually quite happy not to have guests because it meant I had more time to teach. But over time, it starts to become rather odd because it's so... You know, we're not built for this. We're actually kind of mammals. We need warmth. We need company. And so I think it's very, very natural that we're, we're going to be struggling. And I think, you know, even people who have really deep practice have told me that they've experienced like deep disorienting depression for the first time in their lives. So I think we're all doing really, really well. Um, and you should give yourself a lot of credit for that, firstly. <laughs> Um, and the rest, I think it's just absolutely to be expected. It will not always be like that. And in the meantime, you can still have a sense of community by at least tapping in here with our um, talks and retreats. I can't, I don't know any others that are interactive in that way, but you can have a look around. Um, so that's one good idea. And of course, once, you know, this kind of summer period ends and most of us are vaccinated, at least in this country, I think things will start to move again. We'll have retreats where, you know, we actually get together in person 
I know that the groups that invite me will be expecting that. So, um, yeah, keep make, taking refuge in the Dhamma, absolutely. And uh, when you do feel lonely and, you know, isolated, again, just be very, very gentle with that. Because what I've noticed in myself is sometimes these kind of emotions cause an almost instinctive contracting and closing up. And actually, that's a hardness. And it's the precise opposite of what's needed. So sometimes I actually start to move more slowly or I kind of just quieten everything down in my mind. I sort of do things more slowly and put a lot of care into what I'm doing and try to create a sort of nurturing environment for myself. I think that can really help. Um, okay. Could you clarify, I don't know, about near-death experience and the subtle body coming out at this stage in Buddhist perspective, as Ajahn Brahm touched on this, please. The way I've understood it is there's no subtle body or atma leaving dead, leaving the dead, and the mind. Memories, thoughts leave as chutisita, chutivinyana, I don't know, to the next body. Atma and the subtle body. <laughs> The way I've understood is more aligned to Christianity and Hinduism, yes. The present scientific research done with astronomers suggests near-death experience arise because of the low oxygen levels to the brain. <laughs> well, I'd say that's just a symptom. You know, they're just measuring the effect of the near-death experience in the brain. We do not hang out as ghosts in a subtle body, do we? Wow, okay, I'm a bit confused now. Um, um, do we hand out as ghosts in a subtle body? According to early Buddhism, it seems there is some kind of, um, what do they call it, anta something, anta something or other, like in between stage, where we haven't quite decided where to be reborn, and that might be a kind of ghost realm. So yes, you could see it as a subtle body, because ghosts, I guess, are quite see-through. I've not actually seen a ghost, but I don't imagine that they're particularly solid. Uh, somebody once saw me as a ghost that was really crazy she saw me walking through her room in the morning and I was definitely in my room <laughs> that was when we were nuns so sometimes you start to see things so I think the, the mind can do sort of funny things um, so yeah we can be sort of hanging around for a bit before we take rebirth and actually my teacher in Burma had some stories like that like he was asked to go to some villages places because there were still ghosts around the house and the family were like can you ask them to leave because they just don't want to leave the house it's their house right with their kids and their whatever and uh, because of attachment because of clinging they didn't want to move they didn't want to leave so he went there and chanted and you know tried to share merits with them and basically told them to please move on go and get another rebirth you know don't just hang around as a ghost because I think sometimes we kind of are still clinging and then we're not able to actually move on maybe that's partly why people share merits just to give to kind of bring the good karma that that person carries sort of to bring it up for them to help catalyze it in a way so that it will lead to a rebirth but I'm speaking from kind of what do you call it um, I'm speculating really so the near-death experience, I wouldn't say it's a subtle body coming out. No, it's more that the body and the five senses have gone. In fact, they've died, right? Because it's a near-death experience. So for that moment, you've actually died. And because of that, you might see bright lights in the mind, which is very similar to what happens with nimittas. Like that also happens when um, the five senses are disappearing. Sometimes the limiters might come up before the five senses have completely disappeared, but for it to be a really strong one, I mean, it will basically overpower the five senses so you won't actually feel the body anymore. The mind will take over. So in that sense, I mean, there is a similarity. Um, and there have been a lot of reports of near-death experiences like this with people who are not religious in any way. And uh, I saw a little film by one, and I think he was definitely not religious and um, he got dragged under a train he was saying goodbye to his friend and his coat got stuck in the train doorway and he got pulled under the train and he had a near-death experience and um, he had such a strong experience of bliss and going down this tunnel of light that when he came back he said it, it's completely changed his life forever 
and he'd drawn all these paintings of it happening, you know, and these lights and going down these tunnels. And I think he did have some sort of iconography, maybe some like um, angels or something there. But really, we just interpret whether it's angels or whether it's devas according to our conditioning. So I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe there are beings there. Maybe you're going to a certain realm. But then, of course, with the near-death experience, you come back. And yeah, that can happen in meditation too. People with strong samadhi, they go to different realms. You know, maybe they start to see devas and things like that. And also the jhana states are their own realm. The rupaloka, it's like, um, and the arupaloka. So they're brahma realms. So yeah, there's some similarity. Uh, how does transfer of merit work since it isn't the good deed actually done by the recipient? How important is it to practice this? Yeah, I don't really know the mechanism of it. I'm presuming it's a bit like sending metta. Like you're transferring your merit, you're thinking of them with goodwill, you're intentionally sharing the results of your good actions, good deeds. So I don't see why that wouldn't be a kind of energy that would then give them a boost if you just think of it in that way. Like it's a... Even for my father, who's not a Buddhist at all, if he knows that the monks and nuns, myself and also in Perth, are chanting for him, he feels really happy, you know? So in a way they are transferring merit to my dad because merit is really just the happiness in your heart. So I think this is um, how it works. And the other thing is that even if they don't receive it, that's not your business. Your business is to do it because it's good to do, you know? Our business is to purify our own mind and to actually share whatever benefits we have in our life, whatever blessings we have, mentally share them. It's a really great practice because then you're practicing for others, not only for yourself. You know, it's like this meditation is not just for me, it's for others who are going to benefit. So just have that as a perception because almost everything, until we're stream winners or even enlightened, almost everything is just a kind of skillful perception. It's not really going to be totally accurate to the reality or to the truth. So if you find it's helpful, if you feel inspired to do it, do it. Otherwise, it may be that for me personally, something more like meta is a little bit more tangible. It's maybe something that is easier to kind of cultivate into an actual emotion that I then feel I can kind of spread. But um, I think any beautiful thought or deed or bringing someone to mind and mentally sharing that does have effects. Mm. you can I mean sometimes you can ask people obviously if they're dead you can't ask them but it certainly can't hurt oh so somebody said thank you for an amazing experience I've experienced some deep emotions but the support of the retreat you and Ajahn Bramali has helped me hold them and move on from them I do feel quite drained but knowing I have moved forward, that's wonderful. This is the real practice when we're digging into the suffering and experiencing those emotions and learning how to relate to them. This is what really strengthens the mind, strengthens resilience, strengthens the Brahma Viharas. You know, a lot of insight can arise there because that's where you're practicing also with letting go of clinging, isn't it? And noticing how when you cling to them, when you react to them, you fuel them and how you learn to hold them more lightly and actually let them go, like you say. So yes, it's um, it can be draining, but sometimes retreats like that have a really great long-term effect. So hopefully you'll be feeling lighter for it. That's wonderful. Okay, so um, this person has clarified that they were asking me about the Vipassana Goenka method, how to get the most out of it, any misconceptions to avoid. Okay, so, I got a lot out of it as a young person. I was 20 when I did my first retreat and I did my second and third and fourth probably in the same year or something. Um, so I say that because one of my hesitations in recommending it to anybody now is that um, it's really hard work on the body. And at that time I was young, I was doing a lot of yoga and I was doing a lot of the retreats so my body got used to it. And I learned to sit and, you know, even though my knees were killing, I wasn't doing myself any damage, <laughs> really. Um, and also I was practicing a lot. So things quickly started to shift, you know, sensations that were difficult or that could potentially be really painful would start to dissolve. And I was doing a lot of service as well. So I was, you know, at least doing even when I wasn't meditating, I was doing 
on a retreat, I was doing a couple of hours a day. And then when I was serving, it'd be like five or six hours. So because of that, my body could settle into it. And I could also learn to find a way of relating to it that didn't feel like I was pushing myself. But I think for people who haven't ever sat for 12 hours a day cross-legged, it could be really hard. And I'm in two minds nowadays, whether I really want to recommend that to people, unless I know that they're kind of going to come at it with a lot of kindness and that their body is going to be okay, or you could maybe ask for a chair or something. Um, because I'm not so sure that it is helpful um, in the long run to sit through so much pain just for the sake of one or two retreats. Of course, if you're gonna take it much deeper, it can be really helpful in developing equanimity, but not at the expense of doing damage to your body. So, I mean, I find it an incredible practice in terms of really getting to the heart of Vedana and noticing where this craving is arising from. People that talk about only working with the mind and noticing when anger works, arises in the mind and then trying to change your thinking, that's one thing, but how do you even see that anger before it's too late, you know, because when you can feel it in the body, it starts there first, it starts in the body first, and you can catch it straight away. And you can feel that it's arising and passing. And so it never really develops into anything very strong. I mean, right now, I don't do this practice consistently. So I, I actually find I'm more reactive, you know, having not been doing this consistently the way I used to be. So that's really interesting. But the reason that I kind of withdrew from that and um, went into a gentler method and also more of a samatha method is because I got to a certain point where it wasn't getting any deeper. And I realized I needed to develop like deep samadhi. Um, and when you're always focusing on things arising and passing, the object is not stable enough to turn into like a mental object. Sometimes it can for people, like sometimes also for me, the sensations would turn into like lights instead of like it was still sensations but they were light but it was it was again it wasn't a stable object so it's a different kind of samadhi it's not um the deep jhana samadhi i think so um so that's one thing and the other misconceptions i would have is the idea that by sitting through pain or sitting through unpleasant sensations you're sort of purifying your um karmic account because i don't think it's like that as I said before, that simile of the salt sutta shows that actually it's not that however you plant the karma that it arises in exactly the same way as an effect. It's more dependent on the kind of mind it meets in the present. So if you're meeting a mind which is big, gentle, expansive, um, that old past karma, which may be bad karma, will actually not have so much effect. Whereas with Goenkaji's method, it's a bit more like Jainism, like that you have to bear the suffering in order to get rid of the bad karma from the past. And there's actually a sutta in the texts, and I don't remember where, where the Buddha said, well, if that's the case, do you know how much past karma you have? You know, do you actually know? Oh, no, well, we don't really know how much past karma. And do you know that, you know, that these unpleasant sensations you're experiencing are because of past bad karma? Or is it because you're kind of standing on one leg and doing austerities? Oh, no, it's our past bad karma. Well, would the unpleasant sensations arise if you weren't doing all these austerities and standing on one leg? Well, no. Oh, so that must mean that the Jains have really bad karma, a lot of bad karma, <laughs> because you're suffering so much, right? Anyway, I'm not sure if you if 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 that's all a bit too much to get all at once where I'm trying to come from. Um, but I guess my main concern is the sitting through a lot of pain, um, which can strengthen you to a degree, but unless it's going to be like a lifelong practice, I think you probably experience more pain than benefit. I'm not sure. I mean, it is a great starting point for lots of people, but I kind of feel that because you started with this much more gentle approach, it might be slightly counterproductive. I don't know, you could try. I'd be so interested to hear what other people think about that, actually. Yeah. Lately, I'm having silly problem with my eyes during meditation. When I start observing the breath overall, my eyes tend to roll back, which is a bit painful. 
I'm able to relax them within a few moments, but this is repeating and distracting. I'd appreciate any advice, please. Yeah, I mean, I think you're doing the right thing by relaxing them. Um, it does tend to happen with people that their eyes start doing funny things. And I think it can sometimes be when you're getting deeper in your meditation. Sometimes people's eyes start flickering a bit as well in the beginning. So I don't know. I think it could be that there's too much energy in that area of your head and it might be helpful to maybe move your awareness. I don't know where you're watching the breath, whether it's kind of up here. It might be helpful to move it down a bit, maybe. Um, it might also be helpful to do the body scan at the beginning of every sit and purposely relax everything first. Um, yeah, so you are linking it to observing the breath. Um, check how you're observing the breath, whether you're observing it a bit too tightly or closely. That may be it as well. Um, and whether you can have a sort of wider um, field of awareness that includes the breath, but that is wider. So it doesn't feel like your attention's kind of here. I think that might be another thing. Um, and then if it keeps happening and then you keep relaxing them and then it keeps happening, you keep relaxing them, I would say, um, be careful it doesn't get into a bit of a, a struggle because the problem with always trying to do the opposite of what the body wants to do is there can be aversion starts to creep in and then it becomes a bit like controlling. So I'm not sure whether you can just stay with it a bit longer and relax with it before you try to change it. I'm not really sure. Just experiment, I guess, would be my main advice. Yeah, and if it really doesn't work, then maybe you have to open your eyes a little bit even maybe meditate with your eyes slightly open, just looking downward and observe the breath that way. And that way, maybe you can train your eyes to stay kind of relaxed and then gradually close them. You know? But there's a fine line between sort of giving it too much attention and kind of ignoring it. So don't worry too much. It will probably pass fairly soon. How far do we take the precepts? For instance, not killing can go as far as to mean I don't support any institution that kills or sexual misconduct can go as far as celibacy. It can. <laughs> I'm not sure how far to go. Yeah, so just go with what feels right to you at any given time on your path, because as the path deepens, your sila will deepen and become more refined and it will deepen in different ways for different people. So some people might stop at, say, not killing themselves. Some other people might stop at, say, not eating meat. Other people might stop only at being vegan. And then other people might also not want to wear animal products or, you know, or buy anything from organizations that kill. I mean, if you know that an institution kills, I would say try to avoid them if there's an option, an alternative that does the same product. I'm not sure what that product might be. Um, sexual misconduct, yeah. I mean, if celibacy seems like going too far, then it probably is because I don't think it should ever be um, a suppression. Um, but for me personally, it was just very natural because I was just so into my meditation. I really wasn't interested in very much else. And I think after starting my practice, I had one relationship, but it was really strange because actually we were dumber friends and we were very close as dumber friends we used to always talk about wanting to ordain this was when I was about 23 and then when all the feelings started coming to it it was almost like oh no I don't want, actually want this and so it was actually something I didn't want to push it away either but it felt more like something that I needed to go through to come out of the other end in a way and so I knew very clearly that for me, my path was renunciation and that I was actually very much happier being celibate than being in that kind of sticky fix. <laughs> but that's because I'm monastic material. That's why I'm a nun. I'm not saying that's better than being a lay person, but it's just the way my own personal path um, kind of unfolded. And for other people, it might be different. So sexual misconduct, I would say, I mean, Goenkaji had quite a strict sort of criteria for that. And he would have actually said any 
sexual activity that's not inside a completely committed relationship, like pretty much marriage, but as if married. Um, but that was also, in retrospect, I think, very influenced by Indian society as well. Um, but certainly it means being very um, careful in the way you use your sexuality, being very respectful, um, you know, being establishing a great deal of trust and respect in your intimate relationships and, and a lot of honesty and openness as well. Um, so I personally would say, you know, wait until there's a really strong relationship. Yeah. I mean, even for me then, I, I wouldn't really be involved unless I was already, there was a very strong relationship. So I think that is just much more meaningful, but it, it changes, you know, as we progress on the path. So you have to see how far to go, but it shouldn't go so far that it feels tense or that you feel like you're forcing anything because then it's not sustainable. And it's not, it's, yeah, it's like a combination of using your head, using wisdom, but also using your heart, knowing how it fits for you, what feels right for you at any given time and never judging yourself. But it's great that you're asking those things. It's really great. Obviously, the other thing is to check the effect, right, of what you choose. Check the effect on your mind. Is it increasing wholesome states or not? Mm -hmm. Thanks for your thanks. I thought humans have a brain with a function to cognize along with consciousness or awareness. Yes, we do. Why is the heart also referred to as part of consciousness? Please. Is it? And where is it? I don't know. I don't know about that. That's a difficult question because um, some of this is from Abhidhamma and some of it is also from certain traditions, even in the Thai forest tradition, where they start talking about the heart as chitta or the chitta as being in the heart. I'm not quite sure what I mean there. Um, Humans have, fun the brain has a function to cognize along with consciousness and awareness. Consciousness and awareness doesn't arise in the brain or in the heart, it just arises. And then as a result of that, we get a body. So although there might be a kind of correlation with the brain and the heart, there might be activity in those places, that's a sort of result of the consciousness and awareness. I don't think it's dependent on those things because otherwise it wouldn't be possible to have things like near-death experiences. It wouldn't be possible to, um, you know, and people that get into jhanas, deep jhanas, their actual um, ECG and EEG, which measures the heart and the brain, go completely flat. So those things actually stop, but they're not unconscious. So even though consciousness sort of uses channels in the brain, so to speak, makes use of the matter that we have, it's not Consciousness is actually not dependent on that. We can be um, conscious without a body. So I don't think we should really be referring to the brain or the heart as part of consciousness. They might be just kind of stations of consciousness or something like that, but consciousness is in every cell, right? I mean, wherever you put your mind, you can feel sensations. That means your consciousness has gone to that place. It's made contact. So wherever we, and we can be even conscious of things outside as well. So consciousness is big, it's huge, and uh, it goes beyond the body. It's probably not a very good answer. <laughs> Might the fairy realm belong to the... <laughs> These are such funny questions. Might the fairy realm belong to the Celtic corner in one of the Devalokas? Wow, maybe. <laughs> That's really sweet. It seems like the fairies which people see in England and Ireland and maybe other countries too could be types of devas. Yeah, 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 maybe. The Celtic corner, I love it. <laughs> I guess there's as many types of beings as there are mental states, you know, because it's like we create these beings. Like Ajahn Brown says that um, they always talk about, is it 32 or 33 realms? 33, isn't it? of deva realms but he said basically there can be as many as you want it just depends you know what our minds are doing that's just an example of the kind of deva realms there can be <laughs> yeah. 
So why not? But don't think about it too much or you might end up there, hey. <laughs> Antra Bhava, yeah, probably. So Antra Bhava is probably the stage between one human life and another obvious rebirth. Thank you for that. Uh, Ajahn Brahmali this afternoon during the Q&A said it was better not to have someone you have attachment for as a meta object, but that's what I'm trying to do most of the time of my practice. Can you explain what to do? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I think it just means if it's really strong attachment so that um, the meta becomes a little bit invested, you know, like, may you be happy so that you become a better husband or <laughs> may you be happy because I want something from you or just somebody with whom you have a relationship which is quite complicated and because of that a lot of stories start coming in but look we all have attachment for somebody and then if we're going to take a loved person which is part of the practice of metta then surely we're going to have some attachment to them as well and that's normal we can't already not have attachment before we start the practices that are supposed to weaken attachment you know, that's too idealistic. So for me, these practices start where they're at. And it's a shame, one of the translations that he used today changed it quite a lot. It said something like, when one is not full of defilement, one should start practicing this or that. But actually what Bhikkhu Bodhi translates that is when the mind is not obsessed with a particular hindrance, which I think is much better because it, it kind of shows that there will still be hindrances there, Otherwise, we wouldn't need to do any of these practices. But as long as the mind's not obsessed with them, as long as they're not sort of taking over the practice, and you know, you're starting to send metta to somebody you have so much attachment for that you simply can't be cool and relaxed, and the metta's always invested and it's really sticky, it's not really goodwill, it's more like, yeah, increasing your attachment, um, then I think it's fine. Um, metta in itself. I would say helps overcome attachment because it's a, it's one of the most beautiful ways you can relate to another person. I mean, I'm very close to my best friend, but I was sending her meta for three days and it just purified that love, I would say. I would say anyway, it's quite an unconditional kind of love, like a sister. She's like a sister. We grew up together since we were four. I mean, we went to India together. We did everything, you know, together. And now she's on my trust. <laughs> so it's a very unconditional kind of friendship. Actually, it's one of the best examples of metta in my life. So it's actually purified that relationship, I would say. So I would not worry too much. Just see, is the metta working? Is it moving to more and more purified, unconditional love? Or is it becoming more sticky and attached and is your relationship with them causing an obstacle? Yeah, I hope that helps. I wouldn't worry too much. Thank you so much and everybody. Due to a chronic illness. Oh, I'm late, aren't I? Is everyone okay? Does anybody need to go? Is everyone okay? Shall I carry on? Okay. Um, so grateful for the experience. Due to having a chronic illness and having to go through a big surgery last year, I've been extremely tired. It's very hard to get up my energy like before, and I wonder how I can best deal with this in everyday life and in meditation. Very grateful for your answer. So everyday life can be more difficult because everyday life sometimes has pressures and wants us to go at paces that don't suit us. Um, but in meditation, you've got all the time in the world to recover, you know. Meditation is about meeting yourself where you are. So if your energy is low, you meet your low energy and you work with that. You don't rush yourself to get better. You give yourself all the time in the world. That's the best thing. You know, it's only last year. Sometimes we think that there should be a certain, you know, rate of progress or speed, uh, time period by which we should recover. But the body has its own um, healing scale or healing time so i would say as much as you can don't try to get up your energy like before try to meet your energy where it is now and um, in your everyday life if you have to make adjustments try to if you really can't then i would say take every opportunity you can to like lie down and do what i call kind of metaphor resting 
um, just lying down and doing your body scan in a very gentle, restful way and infusing your awareness with lots and lots of loving kindness. It's very healing. I did it after my first COVID jab. And um, yeah, other people did have quite a lot of side effects. Not everybody. But I wonder because I had zero side effects and I actually felt extremely happy and actually quite good. I felt better than before the jab. It was really strange. And somebody said to me, oh, it's probably because you were doing meta straight away afterwards. So try to do that. That's really healing and resting for the body. Even if you only get a few minutes here and there. Uh, how many other questions? Ooh, okay, not too many. Sometimes during meditation, I experience incredible tingling and itching on my skin. Yes, this is not painful, but can become too unbearable to meditate. I try equanimity, focusing on the sensation. I try to focus on other body areas, and the most helpful thing seems to focus seems to be to focus on the impermanence. Should I always try to meditate through sensations as much as possible? I would say there's never an always, but there's never an ever either so that's a bit tricky <laughs> no don't say always because you never know um but i think you know we have to learn to respond to whatever's arising so if what you experience is in is the incredible <clears throat> tingling and itching on your skin and that um focusing on per impermanence is what helps then do it because that's a wise way to meet whatever has arisen for you right now I mean, I've practiced like that for years and it is really helpful, especially when you get tingling because it's so impermanent. It's like, <laughs> so it's actually quite a nice practice. And through the recognizing impermanence, equanimity develops almost like in the background because your mind is taken up, not with the nature of whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, but with the characteristic of the sensation. And that's a deeper level than just the actual feeling itself. So, so I think that's good. And um, if you do stay with it and your mind becomes cooler and more and more equanimous, you'll find that along with that, the sensations also start to calm because the mind and the, you know, physical, physicality is so related. When one calms down, the other calms down, generally speaking. So it's definitely a bona fide path. And also you're establishing mindfulness really, really well. And when things calm, you know, you might find that something else wants to be seen. You might find that the breath starts to come into your mind but there's no like hierarchy of what's the best thing to do and there are people who get into jhanas even through vipassana meditation it's not true like some people who haven't practiced vipassana they say oh in those meditations they never teach jhanas they just teach dry insight but actually i know people from all those traditions who've got into jhanas and the teachers know how to guide them when it happens so i just don't think there's a huge division actually or a huge distinction i think it's just the mind sometimes needs different things at different times. Okay. Oh, that's lovely. Thanks for your kind comments. I'm reading them, but I won't read them out because of time. Dependent origination is my favorite teaching. And every time I hear it, I learn some more. My intention to practice diligently is renewed. May the journey for all of us to the far shore be successful. That's not a question either. Wonderful. I agree with that. I love dependent origination so much. When I first heard that, that was that was it. It was like, this is for life. This is it. This makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is one more question and then a short question about the schedule. So I'll try and do it. Why are mind altering substances not allowed in Buddhism when some can take the mind to altered states of consciousness, which sounds similar to the ones described in dependent liberation? Could they not serve as an aid? It's mainly because I think you're not developing qualities. You know, you're just taking some substance and the substance is doing the work. The whole point of the practice is not to get the experience. The whole point is to develop wisdom along the way. And if you're just taking substances to get experiences, there's actually no wisdom as a result. And at the same time, you're becoming dependent on substances. You know, um, the process of meditation is a gradual thing which starts with ethics. And you need those ethics, you need that goodness, that kind of trust in yourself, that really strong virtue in order to actually be able to hold these kind of very strong states. 
that's why many people when they get close to them you know they they get wobbly because it really kind of challenges who you think you are and if you're not ready for that through developing yourself and refining your mind and cultivating virtue, it can actually do yourself some damage. So I don't think it's a good thing <laughs> to do this. I mean, some people might do it with no obvious ill effect, but I doubt very much that they'll have developed the joy, the inspiration, the inclination to wholesome happiness, the love of the Dhamma, the love of virtue along the way, you know. So, so that's really the reason why the sequence independent liberation is something that is a natural sequence. It's not something that you make happen. And taking um, substances would also signify far too much craving for those states. So it's much, much better to just be aware of things as they are and gain insight into that than to try to have different experiences to the ones that you're having in order to, I don't know, just experience that, it's much better to work with what you've got because that's, you know, what's arising in this moment, that's the reality for you right now. So yeah, we have to ask really why people want to do this. What are they sometimes craving for? And also what are they sometimes running away from? But it is true that you may be able to get into some altered states of consciousness, but it won't have the power to liberate. It just won't have it because there's no right view, there's no virtue. So it won't actually be Samma Samadhi. It probably won't be anywhere near. Okay. Last question. What is the schedule tomorrow? So the schedule tomorrow is exactly the same until after Ajahn Brahmani's second talk. And then hopefully he'll finish around 1.30 and then, or 1.45. And then at two till three, we'll have a closing session with me. And if I remember properly, uh, in that closing session, we'll have some maybe more questions, if there's anything we want to share together. Um, I think it's not going to be recorded, so probably we can talk. Like, you don't have to write it in the box. You can put your hand up and say something. So you can say whatever you want to, you know. And then we'll also have some little groups. So we'll ask you if you wish to join some small groups where you can talk to each other and please don't run away because everyone always loves it. Uh, so we'll have that. And it's also a lovely opportunity to um, come out of relative silence that I'm presuming most of you had at least relative silence and to engage in a Dhamma way on the subject of Dhamma with people who've been on this journey with you. So it's a really nice way back into the world of speech and you know where you can actually have some quality conversation and um, reflect a little bit you know and listen to other people's experiences as well and then we will end that hour long session with some meta meditation because that always has to end a retreat if you leave without that then you leave all raw with jangly nerves and you just haven't put on the healing balm you know that's always been uh, the system in the way I've been trained and it just wouldn't feel right not to go out with all this lovely loving kindness so that is tomorrow's schedule and in the meantime our schedule now is to rest so please enjoy the rest of the evening I hope I did answer everything and uh, wishing you a very restful sleep Remember loving kindness, forgiveness, whatever else you want to do before you sleep. Bring up your generosity, your goodness, and have a lovely rest. Bye.